Thank you for joining me today. We're going to be looking at no-code algorithms that can help you predict the future. So first, my name's Tim O'Neill. I've been with Evolution since they started almost 20 years ago. Evolution is a company that now works in over 100 countries. We've got more than 2,000 companies that we work with and several partners, and we have offices all around the world. We're a leader in the Magic Quadrant. I'm sure you, you've all heard of us. Okay, I want to sort of set the scene here. This is a, a quote from Peter Drucker, who was kind of the father of, of management consulting and a lot of the things that, that we do now, um, sort of post-war stuff. And basically it's, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And it really cuts to everything that um, is how we approach enterprise architecture. Now that covers areas like operational analytics, you know, digital business metrics, forecasting, planning, you know, the whole predictive analytics world. So that's really the scene that I want you to get your head around here is what we'll be talking about today. Now specifically what we're going to look at is what the AI algorithms are and how they work, how we can use them to, live, to deliver value, um, how you yourselves can no-code them so you don't need us to do anything anymore, it's all, all no-codable. And I'll give some examples of some of the, the best ones that we've seen people use recently. Okay, so EAs and the, sorry, algorithms and the EA mission. Well, I mean, algorithms have been around for a while. I mean, you know, Google started, you know, 20 years ago with the page rank algorithm. You know, there's algorithms in, you know, Netflix and YouTube to kind of make recommendations to you about what you should be watching. So it should be no surprise to you that, you know, algorithms is becoming a very powerful thing. They're digital brands in their own right. And what it's doing is essentially datafying our world, you know, turning ourselves into numbers. And what we're looking to do is actually try to apply this in a more corporate setting and to apply the continuous feedback that has made a lot of these algorithms very successful. So in our context with architects, well, I mean, architecture used to be very much about just boxes and lines, you know, drawing your, your pictures of, you know, interface diagrams and things like that. But you know, the market's moved on a lot since then. Um, it's now, um, in our opinion, focused much more about analytics and about algorithms. And that's a true architectural concern. So whether you're looking at um, you know, measuring or scoring your business models and processes or looking to, to harvest patterns and technologies or indeed you know, do risk and compliance and stuff like that. So I guess the open question is, well, can enterprise architecture be algorithmic? Well, I guess I'm here to tell you that it already is. So when we talk about delivering an architecture mission, so this is kind of each scenario that you're looking at or each use case you're working through. So each one of these options has their own set of outcomes or metrics. Um, they are modelled and then they are analysed. So that's a very important kind of cycle that you're going through. You model something and then you analyse the, the kind of um, results of that model and, and look at the options that you're exploring. So if we were to work through, you know, like a cloud migration piece of work, fundamentally that we, you know, we need to understand the objectives that the company has in terms of, you know, which portions do they want to go to the cloud? Is it public cloud, private cloud or hybrid, of course? We need to come to understand the business a bit in terms of its landscape and discover what's there already. We might then go through some sort of cloud readiness scoring algorithm. Okay, we might do some inference around the target architectures that we can do. We might do some economic algorithms around the, you know, the cost of these things. And of course, some visualization algorithms to try to see what it is that uh, we're proposing. And then ultimately, we're going to make some recommendations and those recommendations need to be quantitative. Okay, but that equally applies to any number of other sort of missions or use cases, whether it's APM or compliance or, you know, some digital transition. It's an equally relevant um, approach. So just quickly sort of categorising algorithms as, as we see them. Um, first of all, they all operate on the enterprise graph. Okay, I don't need to, to elaborate on that too much other than to say that, you know, the boxes and lines were really underlying that in the repository of what we call components and connections. You know, they are the entities and the relationships between things. Now, all of those things also have attributes or properties. Okay, so we can categorize algorithms by kind of how they do operate on that graph, or indeed, do they make an entirely new graph themselves? Okay, so there's sort of property-based algorithms, which are you know, under the kind of auspices of what you might call analysis. Okay, and that's a lot of what I'll look at today. There are then some structural algorithms. So these are things that actually create new parts to the graph, you know, create new components and connections or remove components and connections. 
There's then algorithms that look at presentation, and so how can you make new views? So we have things like world according to algorithms, which will create you a kind of context map for your particular interest. And ultimately, you have our, um, algorithms that can produce entire architectures in their own right. And that's what we refer to as a type four uh, roadmap. So there's different types of algorithms, and I'm going to focus on that, that sort of first category, which is you know, the, the property-based ones. They're the most familiar ones to people. Okay, so yeah, it's all about data or data. Now, unfortunately, architects, executives, you know, they don't have time to study even a single diagram. You know, I've seen some pretty horrendous big A0 landscape pictures put up on the walls. Um, you know, if you're gonna make decisions, that's just not gonna do it. The only decision you'll really make from that is that you know, things are too complicated and we might need to get a new architecture team. <laughs> Anyway, um, let alone you know, whether you're trying to look at tens or hundreds of diagrams, um, it's just not the way that decisions can be made. If we look at the attention span, they did some studies on this back in 2000. Apparently, the average attention span for a person was 12 seconds. Um, Microsoft did some refresh on this research back in 2015, and they found that it had fallen down to only eight seconds. And I guess you'll be pleased to know that the average goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. So. We have an attention span less than a goldfish nowadays. So what do we have to do? We've got to take ownership of the digital metrics that are out there. We've got to work with each line of business to understand the performance of the architecture relevant to them. You've got to think about what are the metrics that each stakeholder wants to have the answer to. Do they want to know how much things are? Do they want to know if it's going to be more simple? Do they want to know how things are going to scale? Do they want to know if it's more available? So these are the sort of hard questions that we need to give some quantitative feedback to the lines of business about. Okay, now how do we get you to do that? Well, we can put you in the driver's seat. So this is where I'm going to introduce the concept of no code um, to enterprise architecture. So we're the first vendor to provide this. And what it basically is looking at doing is, is making it very simplified, democratizing algorithms in the enterprise architecture space, allowing the architects to do it themselves. You don't need evolution. You don't need my consultants to do this. You can do this um, yourselves. So no code. So some of you have probably heard about this. So Scratch is a very popular no code platform. Um, it's used by, by kids. My eight year old son uses this. So it's taught in all the schools today. It's really turned procedural programming into a very block-based or very um, simplified way of doing it. But it's incredibly powerful. You can, you can code some amazing things with it. Google has a, has a recent entrant into this market called Blockly. But you can see both of these. They're very simple. They're very procedural-based. Um, now, you might be aware that in the data preparation field, um, there's actually a fair bit of block-based stuff that goes on there, and you can learn a lot from that about how you manipulate data from the data preparation field in how, of course, we can operate on architectures. Okay, let's get into it. So um, we've got five examples here that I want to walk you through. Well, it's really a simple mathematical one. It's about post-processing after you've done a synchronization. So pulled in a whole lot of content from a CMDB, in this case, ServiceNow. So we've pulled in a list of all of our servers, maybe all of our applications, our risks, you know, whatever stuff that we've got in ServiceNow, we can pull those in using, using Abacus. Now, of course, we're at the mercy of what's in something like ServiceNow for what the format of that data is. So let's assume that the date on the servers is just an installation date. So that's all we know is when was the server installed, okay? Um, now, what if we want to find out what's old? Okay, I mean, old is a kind of constantly moving horizon. So essentially what we're going to want to do is compare, well, when was something installed from its date to what's today's date? So what's old um, today may not have been old yesterday. Okay, so it's going to be a very simple bit of math that we need to do that is just doing a subtraction. Okay. So first, you're going to have to set up the ServiceNow synchronization and configure it. And indeed, you know, because you set it up to trigger so that the algorithm will run, of course, after every time you do a synchronization. So there's a couple of screenshots here about how to do that. I won't, I won't really go into that in detail here. But essentially, you set up the algorithm to run. Now, how might you have done this already? I mean, I guess you could have bashed out um, a calculator and, you know, one by one, you know, worked out kind of how old things are. You know, it's really just a single property that you're trying to calculate and work out which ones are, are a certain age. 
But you know, ultimately, of course, this is ripe for having a very simple algorithm to, to do. So we don't need to use calculators anymore. So let's have a quick walkthrough here. This is a, a, just a brief animation that shows how you build up one of these block-based algorithms. So the first thing we've done here is we've pulled in a list of all of the servers. Remember, this is going to trigger after the um, synchronization runs. Okay. So we've got a list of servers. Um, we know we've got a property on them that's partially complete. So the first thing is we need to cope with the fact that there might be a lot of blanks in there. So that first block is going to clear out the blanks and set them to today's date. Okay. The next block I'm putting in here is doing a subtraction. So it's doing that simple mathematical function, which is you know looking at today's date using date.now and subtracting the value that was in that column. So that's going to return a value in days. Okay. We now need to go and um, divide that by 365 to break it into years. But of course, that's going to be a, um, a value that has many decimal places. So let's go and round this now to one decimal place. So there's a collection of blocks we've used here to simply just pull in a value, clean up the data, so do a bit of data prep ourselves, um, divide it by 365 and round it to one decimal place. Then ultimately we need to write that value into a property or a field in the graph. So in this case, we're gonna write it into the age field. So that's it. So um, simple as that. We've now got this algorithm composed and we can indeed run it. So let's have a look at how that might run against an architecture. So we've got a catalog here at the bottom. Um, it's showing, of course, a list of servers. There's a column in the middle there, which is called age. And just to the left of that is actually the property that's pulled in from the, um, the ServiceNow repository, the date. OK, and you can see there's a num set of numbers there, which are one decimal place. And indeed, um, this hasn't been run for a while. So a lot of those numbers are quite out of date in terms of the fact that they're relevant to whenever it was last run. So what we're going to do here is we're going to run this algorithm. You'll see those numbers change. Okay, and essentially we're going to look to see how many of them are over a certain age. So the first thing is there's one and a half thousand of them. We're going to filter this down now to say, give us a look at the ones that are greater than I think 15.4 um, years. So there's only eight. There's only eight servers from when we last ran it. But when we run it now, all of a sudden, hey, look, there's over 80 servers now that are over that age. So just as simple as that, we're just showing a list basically but it's a moving horizon. You've got to remember that if this is run every time after you do a synchronization, that list is going to shrink and it's going to grow as servers are, um, of course, decommissioned, as these, these ones probably should be, um, or indeed as time moves on, some more servers will obviously pass that event horizon, the, the 15 years old horizon. Okay, let's have a look at the second algorithm we've got for you today. So this one is all about do some scoring or some rating of things. Um, so, for example, let's say we want to look at applications. Let's say we want to come up with a health score. Now, this is equally applicable to like a cloud readiness score, like you saw me talk about back in the mission there, or some GDPR compliance or security rating. There's any number of scoring algorithms we've, we've seen people do. Um, this one in particular, let's call it a business fit score. Um, it's a weighted function of a number of properties, okay, and also some associations. So what we're talking about there is in our graph, looking at what things are connected, in this case, to applications. So here we're actually going to look at how many processes does each application um, serve, or indeed looking at the other way, um, how many applications are used by each process. Okay, so it's a, it's a multi-factor, a multivariate function here, and indeed it's weighted so that you might choose to say that, hey, the criticality is highly weighted, whereas the type of application is only low weight or something like that. Okay, and it's using some pretty interesting math here. We're using log functions and stuff like that. How would you have done that in the past? I'm sure you guys, like I, have seen any number of spreadsheets for this. Every consultancy's got a spreadsheet that they can ask you to fill in with, you know, 50 columns to gather all the stats for each application, and then they'll run some formula. Usually they hide that formula from you. They don't want you to know their IP. But here we're being much more transparent. These are all no-coded, so it's completely transparent, open to you as users. You can tweak them and change them however you like. But anyway, all these different spreadsheets, though, are out there. Now, obviously, I'm saying here, we don't need to do this in a spreadsheet anymore. You can do this with one of these sort of no-code algorithms. So let's have a look at that. Um, OK, on the left here, we've got, again, a catalog, a list. Basically, we're looking at this business fit score. That's that leftmost column. You can see numbers like 2.25 and things like that. And then the, the columns to the right are those factors or those um, features or those um, 
properties that are underlying that calculation. On the right, we've shown the algorithm. I'm not going to build that up again. It's using different functions like we saw in, in the formula there with you know log and stuff like that. And so ultimately, when we run that, what's going to happen here is we've got a current score here of minus 0.49. So we're going to change the criticality, increase that. We're going to increase the number of users here. So of course, we expect this to have a higher business fit. So when we run this, it's going to go from minus 0.49 to, in this case, 2.42. Okay, and just to sort of show you that again, so we're going to kind of undo and redo here just to show you. So we're simply showing you how, of course, this value has been calculated according to these underlying fields. Now, again, um, it's a simple formula, but in this case, you would have been using something like Excel. Now you can go and no code that. Okay, the third algorithm we're going to look at is video making. So let's imagine we've got a portfolio of things. Um, and I'm using the word things because this is very generic. Um, and you want to come up with some quantitative metrics to be able to objectively make a decision about the future of each of the items in the portfolio. Okay. Now this covers the areas of you know, PPM project portfolio management, application portfolio management, IT portfolio management, service portfolio management, ideation, risk management. It's basically whatever you want portfolio management. We call that enterprise portfolio management. So it's whatever things you have in your enterprise graph. Okay, so whatever component types you have or element types you have. And indeed, you can do this for connection types or relationship types as well. So it's for any of these things coming up with some metrics to be able to make some objective decisions. Okay. Typically, you'll use at least two metrics to do this. Okay, it might be you know, cost or probability versus impact technical fit versus business fit, you'll put them into some sort of matrix. Okay, now that could be like a time, a tolerate, invest, migrate, eliminate, or the four R's of retain, redesign, refresh, retire. Um, it could be a five by five risk matrix where you're you know, straight up looking at probability versus impact. And there's any number of ideation methodologies out there with you know quick win versus big bet, fold, hold, or how now, wow. So there's any number of different um, approaches out there. The important thing to appreciate here, though, is the machine is really only giving you a suggestion. Okay, so it's basically the math that's going to tell you something. The recommendation, which is obviously coming from the person, has to look at that suggestion, but it'll take potentially other factors into account before a recommendation is made. Now, um, I guess um, when you step into this world, you do start getting into some pretty interesting mathematics here. So, for example, you might use some Pythagoras theorem to do some risk management. So with a five by five risk approach, you're essentially trying to work out as how far is a risk from the bottom left hand corner. And that's when you're plotting it in terms of probability versus impact. So that's Pythagoras. It's pretty simple. Some of the squares, right? Um, you might need to do some conversion into quadrants. Okay, so I bet you didn't think you'd be I'm hearing about arctangent two as a function today. So that is the technique you can actually use to convert um, an X, Y, or what are called Cartesian coordinates, so let's say business fit and technical fit, into one of those individual quadrants. Okay, so you can use Arctan 2 to work out which quadrant is the result in. Okay, now how would you do this? You know, there's any number of bespoke tools out there. We've seen them all. They all make nice, pretty bubble charts. Um, they plot something versus something else. Some of them have some math in them. Some of them don't. Um, but needless to say, it's a pretty stock standard approach to doing portfolio management is to come up with some dimensions, let's say two, plot them on a bubble chart, and of course, decide what your recommendation is off where the bubble sits. So we can make that a bit smarter. We can no-code algorithm to actually make a suggestion about how we think you should be recommending something. So of course, we don't think you need to use all those bespoke tools. Okay, so let's have a look at this in Abacus. So we're using our web product here. So this is essentially um, what we were talking about on the right. There is a portfolio. So in this case, it's a portfolio of applications. We're going to look at business fit and technical fit. So just like we looked at that scoring before for biz fit, that's going to be plotted into two axes here. The vertical axis is business fit. The horizontal axis is technical fit. So that's the bubble chart you can see on the left there. Now the color of the bubbles is the actual recommendation, not the suggestion. Okay. So the algorithm is making a suggestion, which is that second column there. So often you can see they're the same. Okay, So that top one website, you can see it's basically retain, and the suggestion is also retain. But look at the second one, IVR. 
we're actually suggesting you should retain it, but the recommendation is retire. So that's that red bubble in the top right. There. So top right is text, tends to be the retain um, quadrant, bottom left tends to be the retire quadrant. Okay, so we've got an interesting one here, which is CRM. That's the bottom row in the portfolio down there. And this is just a subset of the portfolio. Um, but here we're looking at CRM. You can see the color is purple because the recommendation is redesign or tolerate. Um, but the suggestion currently is retain. Okay, and that's why, of course, it's up in the top right. So the, the algorithm is telling us we think we could retain it. But for, for various reasons, the architect has decided, no, 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 we need to redesign this and, and do some work. OK, so let's obviously see how the machine's recommendation might change according to changes in underlying fields, which will affect the business fit and the technical fit, and then ultimately, potentially, the recommendation. So as we play this animation, we can see that if we chain, dial down the criticality from 5 to 1, the number of users from 200 down to 10, and then from the technology point of view, instead of it being a browser-based app, let's make it a, you know, a thick client app. So if we were to rerun that instead of having um, the recommendation being retained in the top right, the recommendation is now changed to retire. So that purple bubble has jumped from the top right down to the bottom left. You can see it down there, the CRM. So our recommendation is now to retire. In fact, if it's not really a very popular application and it's got some old tech, then of course the machine's going to say, hey, I think you should retire it. So really you've got to rethink, well, should we be redesigning this thing now? If the recommendation changes to retire, well, that's going to kick off a whole lot of road mapping work because now we've got to try and work out what to do with the people that were using that. Anyway, that's classic portfolio management and it applies in, in lots of different domains, whether um, it's APM in this case or yeah, PPM risk management. You can do all that using no code now as well. That's actually just a, a view of the algorithm there, which shows you the Arctan and the um, the yeah, basically they're pulling it into quadrants. So the Arctan produces a pi, I don't know if you know pi on two, like it goes from minus pi on two to pi on two, and then ultimately into a scoring. Okay, let's look at the fourth heat mapping. Let's say we need to give executives a very quick overview, some of the state of play around their area. So we're essentially um, wanting to tell them about things they're interested in, in a way that they are familiar. So that might be presented onto the business capability model or onto an operating model. The most common technique people use here is a RAG status. So they talk about you know, red, amber, green, um, and they look to, of course, draw the attention to the red areas and, and make people feel comfortable with the green areas. We're going to leverage the graph again, and we're going to take the attributes from one place in the graph. Okay, So let's say from the applications and the departments, so from the people and the technology, and we're going to look to attribute that through the graph across to the actual capabilities and the processes. So again, we're leveraging the graph now, and the algorithms are actually cascading properties across and through the graph. Okay. Now, in the past, you would have presented this using you know, PowerPoint or you know, just coloring you know, some, you know, some tool with you know, a property, you know, it's pretty simple heat mapping stuff. Okay. You, know, you might have done that you know, using Visio or PowerPoint, of course. But now you can do all this underlying um, algorithm. So doing this attribution, you can actually calculate this to using no code stuff so that you don't have to make it up. It's not guesswork anymore. It's not subjective. You can objectively score things like capabilities from other things that you can um, objectively score themselves. So it's not subjective anymore. You can take properties from some place that you know and now reason about them in another place where you never had an objective measure before. So it's very powerful taking what you know and taking it to somewhere else where you didn't know. So obviously we're saying you don't need to be doing that in PowerPoint Visio anymore. You can do it in a much smarter way. So this is a very simple algorithm. Okay, it's in this case it's just taking the average of the score of the applications and overlaying them onto a business capability model. So this one on the right here is your classic boxes within boxes. It's it's actually from the um, APQC. It's a standard process classification frame with areas of you know, operating areas and, and management support areas. So simply what we do is we um, take the average of the application scoring and we attribute that across to the capabilities and we apply a heat map color gradient. So that's the red, amber, green. Okay, so what we're seeing here is um, back to that tolerate, invest, migrate, eliminate. So that color scheme we saw for the APM technique before. Okay, purple means redesign. So there's a lot of areas that are being redesigned. 
Um, orange means refresh. So we're doing some tech refresh in a lot of areas. Green means, of course, retain and leave it as it is. And indeed, down the right there, you've got one that's just verging on retirement. Okay, remember, this is an average score. So it's going to be somewhere in between the pure um, scoring of, of, in this case, redesign and retire. Okay. But you get this very quick overview of where are things changing in our portfolio. Now, this is from a capability point of view. Now, there's obviously a lot of change happening, which is what's quite interesting. And then drilling into that change would be a fascinating exploration of how are these things changing. Now, that's where we're getting into roadmap, which, as it happens, is the fifth algorithm. So when we look at this, what we're looking to do is essentially um, use date properties and start to do different things around how you can using the underlying structure of the graph. So let's say we want to look at how, when, and why things are changing. So we just saw how we know things are changing. So things are going purple, things are going orange, so stuff's changing. We want to understand how and why that's happening by cascading the statuses. So we just saw that. We just saw how you can cascade that recommendation or the, rec or the suggestion through the architecture. Um, we're going to use the dates and cascade them and obviously leverage the dependencies between each of these areas as a way of doing this. OK, now this is not just, you know, glorified Gantt charts. OK, you know, there's a few tools out there where you can just draw Gantt charts. It's not that we're looking to leverage the graph and leverage the understanding we have in some area to be able to reason about it in another area. So that's you know, graph based algorithms, right? So, you know, for example, if you put a stop on a project, you're going to understand what is the implications, what's the ripple effect of doing that stop. You know, as you've seen, if the scoring of something changes, how does that affect the recommendation? Let's say we were planning to refresh something, but all of a sudden we're now going to retire it. Okay, well, that effect, or that status change is going to be cascaded and it's going to affect other things. Okay, so leveraging that understanding across the graph is a very powerful approach. Now, as I say, you might have done all this, you certainly do your project execution using something like Microsoft Project, okay, but there are these sort of bespoke tools out there that, you know, draw you a nice pretty Gantt chart with, um, you know, just dates, start and finish. Okay, so of course we're saying you don't need to use those anymore, you can do this using a much smarter approach. So here we've got a, a dashboard again using um, a web product, so this is showing capabilities in a roadmap on the left so it's some life cycles for the capabilities and then on the right is the underlying technology and departments that underpin that so remember the, the you know, people process technology you know these dates for the um, capabilities and the processes are driven off the underlying dates in the processes and the people area of the business so as we drill in here you can see we go inside the capabilities we now go inside the operating processes inside customer service and you know, we're going down through the hierarchy we're sort of five levels down inside the process and capability hierarchy and we've got a life cycle there for an overall capability now what you can see is that life cycle is driven by the underlying dates for the technology and the people so the earliest date is the application the end date is the department so if we're now to change the dates around IVR, which was that technology that was driving things, so let's push out that retirement date. Let's push it out now, say, 10 years. Okay, So that third bar down there, the IVR bar, we're saying let's make that longer. And what you'll see is as we apply that, the length of that third bar, of course, increases. Now that immediately affects the actual life cycle or the roadmap for the capability because, of course, the capability is pushed out now due to dependencies. Now, ultimately, what we're starting to understand is the ripple effect that would happen above that. So, of course, we had a capability that we thought we were finishing with in 2020, but now, sorry, 2030, but now it's been pushed out five more years. Okay, now, that's going to affect cost calculations. So we have algorithms for that. And you'd be able to understand the exact ripple effect of, hey, look, if we're just not going to retire this application for another 10 years, what is the cost implication of that? And we'd be able to understand that in a very detailed way. So these are the sort of algorithms you can do when you're using no code. It's applying all these different approaches to the different um, elements you have in your graph, whether it's heat mapping, whether it's road mapping, whether it's scoring, they're all possible from a no code point of view. Now, having said that, there's plenty of challenges ahead. Okay, so some questions are particularly hard. Okay, and we use machine learning to answer some of those. Um, so we can talk about that in a whole different session. Um, so certainly some of the hard questions are not deterministic. So we're applying machine learning approaches to try to fill in the gaps there where we where we can. 
Um, and ultimately judgment is still needed. So even though the box or the machine is going to give you a suggestion, you still need to interpret that and make a recommendation. But algorithms are here. They're here to stop that shouting across the chasm about who thinks they're right. You, know, you can use some um, objective data science and math to actually strip through that subjective opinion and make some valuable recommendations. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a few uh, minutes for questions ultimately, but if, if we run out of time, then obviously come and visit us at the booth and we can give you a demonstration of Abacus and grab a trial of Abacus today. Thank you.